Good afternoon, everybody. So, my name is David Green, and today I'm going to talk about the importance of measuring aerosol uh, composition and how we can use it to develop targeted mitigation. I'm going to start with the cartoon to ease you in nice and gently, and this is meant to display and explain the complexity of aerosol sources. So, along the bottom, we've got a range of aerosol sources, and they start with anthropogenic sources over here and move to more natural sources here. From all of these sources, there's released either gases or particles directly, uh, and they merge into the atmosphere, and in the atmosphere, particles are formed from the gases, and particles grow through the process of uh, condensation and nucleation. They're then transported, and transportation can be very short. People can be only a couple of meters away from a source. They're transported to the population which is exposed and to the air pollution site that we're measuring at. Now, we've got a range of sources here, and I'd like to start with a little bit of audience participation to keep you warmed up after lunch. So, a quick show of hands. Who thinks that traffic is going to be the most important air pollution source that we see in the UK? Or either you're all asleep or nobody <laughs> believes that. Okay. Can I go with agriculture? Yeah, that's, that's, there's a few people there. Uh, wood burning? Uh, not even Gary put his hand up for that. <laughs> okay, and what about what happens all the way up there in the atmosphere? All that processing, nucleation, anybody on that one? A few people on that one. Okay, well, the good news is, to a certain extent, you're all right, because it depends where you are and when you are there, because all of these sources are... Uh, are emitting at different rates, at different times of the day, different seasonal parameters, and the atmosphere is processing them at different ways, different times, different seasons. And I'll come back to that, that episodic aspect of, uh, of aerosol science in a little bit. But first of all, I'm going to go on to what the measurements tell us. Now, this is, uh, this is PM1, so these are the very small particles, less than one micron in diameter. Um, and this is from Ian Chen's paper. Uh, and these are measured using aerosol mass spectrometry. So aerosol mass spectrometry. So we take all the particles in, we blow them apart into their mass fragments, and we've got some measurements from the ethylometer there to give us back carbon. So this tells us what our particles are made up on average over a two-year period at an urban background site in London. And what you can see is we've got nitrate ammonium sulfate. Now, these are secondary inorganic aerosols. And then we've got organic mass as well. And using the data that we get from this aerosol mass spectrometer, we can perform some multivariate statistical analysis on it and break it down into its separate sources. Just under half of it is secondary, and then there are equal contributions of primary sources, traffic, wood burning, and cooking. If we look at it as a whole, what you can probably see is that well over half of it comes from originally from gases which are released in the atmosphere. So that's VOCs that are processed to organic aerosols and things like um, NOx that's emitted, ammonia that's emitted, sulfur dioxide that's emitted and processed into those inorganic aerosols. And that's very, very important because that tells us where they're coming from. Next, let's consider what modelling tells us. Now, modelling is great because I can measure it a couple of locations in a great deal of detail, but modelling allows me to understand the heterogeneity in space. So what we've got is one of uh, Sean, or the modelling team's, PM2.5 maps of the UK, and the red blots, blodges, splodges, are where PM2.5 is at its highest. So you can see there's a great deal of heterogeneity across the UK. It's highest in the cities um, and tends to be highest in the southeast of the UK. We can focus in on London, and this is actually a... Um, a I think a 20-metre map of kind of South London, but for NOx, because that represents better the variability in traffic emissions. So you can see, even when we focus down onto a city, there's a great deal of heterogeneity in the city. And what this is telling us is we can't just measure at one location. We have to understand um, the sources, the processes, and extrapolate them to lots and lots of places. OK, I'm going to structure my talk around these four challenges uh, to develop targeted mitigation. And these are challenges for aerosol science. So we've got quantifying the sources. We need to quantify them to understand them. 
We then need to use this data to inform policy. Then we can use what we're learning and any policy um, abatement processes that are put into place to assess progress, track that progress of that policy. The other important aspect is we tend to measure PM 2.5, and all of, go back a few, all of this stuff up here, all this mixed aerosol, is measured as PM 2.5 traditionally. What we're trying to do is break it down into its component sources after we've measured it. What we don't know, or are only just starting to get a glimpse into, is the variable toxicity of those different aerosol sources. And we need to explore how aerosol science can help us understand that variable health impact. Okay, I'm going to start with quantifying the sources. You've seen pretty much these pictures earlier, but these are the air quality super sites. So we've got Maribyrn Road, uh, which is close to that six-lane highway in the centre of London, and then we've got Honor Oak Park, which is our background site in urban uh, south-east London. These are very mature, very well-developed sites. They didn't just spring into existence. They're the result of lots of work from myself and my team over many, many years. Uh, and it's been going since 1997. And I suppose one of the successes is to the early adoption and trial of new instrumentation, which in, uh, enhances our ability to understand those different aerosol sources. So back in 1997, you can tell by the quality of the photographs as well, can't you? Uh, this is uh, Maribyrn Road just after it was put in. Um, we didn't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of sampling inlets up here or anything, um, but it was by far the most advanced measurement site in the country when it was put in. It was placed here so that it was close to a heavily trafficked road. We didn't have those in London. And it was placed here because if you looked across the other side of the road, for some reason, there were lots and lots of people queuing outside Madden de Sores to see waxworks. I've never understood it myself, but it's one of the locations where people stand by the side of the road for hours on end. So what did we have in there? Well, if we consider the high time resolution measurements, we were using instrumentation like the TEALM, and this is a, a, a standard instrument that we use for many, many decades, um, and we were just measuring PM10. We were also collecting filters, and on those filters, we were measuring PM10 again, uh, heavy metals, uh, just uh, lead at the time, and a very simple measurement of black smoke. One of the themes that stayed with us through the super sites um, for pretty much 30 years is the trying to understand what these real-time measurements here are telling us when we compare them to the gravimetric standard on filters. And that has stayed with us all of the time. We're still struggling to find accurate real-time measurements of PM um, that equate to the reference measurement. Okay, jump forward 10 years. Things have advanced a little bit. Marathon Road has had a bit of a makeover. Um, it's looking a bit scruffier, actually. But there's a lot more measurements going on, a lot more samplers on, on the roof. One of the other things we've learned by now is that it's really important to have a measurement at background location to help you understand what the roadside increment is. You saw that in Gary's presentation when he was comparing PM10 and PM2.5 background and roadside. Once you can start to do that with aerosol composition, you gain a lot more information. So we've added North Kensington as a background site, and we squeezed a lot of uh, measurements into here. We've expanded our, uh, our high time resolution measurements. We've moved from PM10, and we're now measuring PM2.5. Importantly, we're also measuring particle size distribution. So those particles that are, in, uh, that are emitted into the atmosphere tend to be very, very small. Um, these are growing, and uh, they're, uh, we're measuring them between about 10 nanometers and about 800 nanometers. And that can tell us a lot about the sources and how they're processed in the atmosphere. And we've got one of the longest time series of particle size distributions in Europe. Uh, we've still got our black carbon measurements, um, and we've upgraded to a real-time method of that. But we've also been early adopters of chemical real-time chemical speciation. And the instrumentation is starting to get a bit more, uh, well, the instrumentation is starting to get more interesting. And we've got a real-time nitrate instrument here. And you saw how important nitrate is for us in terms of the overall uh, parts of the pie. So we're trying to understand here the importance of those secondary inorganic aerosols. In terms of filters, we've added PM10 and PM2.5. And again, we're expanding 
our range of chemical comp uh, components. So we're measuring nitrate, ammonium sulfate, and uh, elemental and organic carbon. But these are being measured at a daily time resolution. The difference between daily time resolution and hourly is that with an hourly time resolution, you can start to understand those short-term emissions of sources and the atmospheric processing and the long-range long transport that are so important. Okay, I'm going to bring us up to date now, and this is 2023. Uh, Marylebone Road has had a, its full makeover. It's now clad in wood, and uh, we've bought a drone. <laughs> and this, we've also moved. So this is no longer North Kensington. This is now Honor Oak Park. Um, this gives us a lot more space, and you can see it's a lot, a lot more open atmosphere. So it's much more representative of that background aerosol as it's transported into London. Uh, it's much more highly instrumented as well. Um, we've moved on again. We've added really, really importantly um, high time resolution measurements of metals and minerals. This wasn't contained in the pie I showed you earlier. Um, now, these metals and minerals will tell us about other important sources that aren't coming from combustion. So these are sources like marine aerosol. These are sources like non-exhaust aerosol, so we can measure Barium as a, as a tracer for brake wear, zinc as a tracer for tire wear. And that is really going to help us to understand the challenges ahead as we reduce emissions from internal combustion engines and we're left with those non-exhaust emissions. The inside of the cabins is looking a more, lot more like a laboratory now. Uh, so we've got racks of instruments and it's all looking very scientific. Uh, in terms of chemical composition, um, We've closed our pie, so we're now able to measure that complete composition of PM1, and we're able to apply that source apportionment analysis to understand the relative contributions. For filters, again, this pretty much hasn't changed. We're still measuring PM10 and PM2.5. Um, we're now measuring PAHs at Marylebone Road. Some of our, um, our, our uh, chemical composition has just transferred to measured in real time continuously. Now, London's quite well equipped for super sites. We've got one at the roadside and one at the background, which is, which is very rare um, in Europe. But if we look at the wider European context now, these two sites should be considered within a larger network. And this network is partly under the uh, umbrella of Actris, which is um, uh, a scientific group within Europe that looks at uh, national facilities and ensures that all the data is comparable, but also within the RA Urban's um, project, which you're going to hear a little bit more about in a minute, and the wealth of data that we can get from Europe as a whole when we're measuring this, all of these chemical components from all these different uh, locations using the same techniques. An example of that uh, is an expansion of what I showed you earlier. So the pie I showed you earlier can be done at all of these sites across Europe. Again, this is from Ian Chen's paper. And you can see similar pies and similar splits with different components at all these different sites across Europe. There are some real commonalities in what we see. So the organic aerosol mass is making up about half of what you'll see at most locations. It can depend where you are. If you go to northern Sweden or Norway, it tends to be a little bit higher because you've got uh, a lower contribution of primary aerosol. And you pick up some unexpected things. In Finland, the monitoring site is fairly close to a coffee roasters. So there is a clear signature of coffee roasting in the local location. Uh, now, this is very powerful because we can now pass this to epidemiologists, and they can compare the results across different cities and look at the comparison of mortality and morbidity effects across whole European continent. So that's super sites, specific locations. But as we heard from Ben earlier, we don't spend all of our time at one location. And lots of our exposure comes from short term, uh, short periods of, uh, of exposure in specific locations. So what we sought to do was to develop systems which allow us to quantify sources in different environments. We did this originally for, the, um, uh, for rail networks. So we're looking at underground and overground railways. So what we did, we shrunk down what we would normally have in a normal measurement site, so measuring NOx, ozone, 
um, and a wide range of particle metrics. So we're, me we're counting particles here between 10 nanometers and 10 microns, and that gives us the ability to differentiate the sources. We're also collecting onto filters so that we can examine in the laboratory afterwards. And that system is called uh, Morse, um, and that system is outside, um, and Mike Hedges will be able to show you around it if you're interested. And in this study, we took it on one, over 100 um, journeys on different diesel trains around the UK. Many of them starting from London, but we also had some in Scotland, um, some across the north of England as well. And the idea was to understand what passengers and staff are exposed to um, while they're traveling and to try to get an understanding of the sources. The really useful piece of instrumentation on, on Morse is the wide range particle spectrometer. So this is called the MINIMAS. And this graph is a summary of, uh, of all of the uh, samples we took. Um, so on the down here, we start at 10 nanometers, and this is a logarithmic scale, and it goes all the way up to 10 microns, and then we've got mass concentration on the side. And using the same techniques as Ian's used to differentiate that organic aerosol, we can break apart that size distribution, and we, um, we found three clear distinct sources. The first one in green is what you would get from the diesel engine, from the, the driving engine of the train. The red one is what's uh, imported into the train from, uh, from outside, so what we call mixed ambient. The blue one was somewhat of a surprise for us, but we found this, uh, these largest particles are associated with stopping at stations and the movement of passengers around the train. So when you're measuring PM on a train, you may have put it all down to, um, uh, down to the diesel exhaust, but it's not. So here's a breakdown of that. So this is one train journey. Um, from Marylebone Station up to uh, Birmingham and then back to Marylebone again. Um, so this is a, what's that, four hour journey, four hour return journey. Um, so we're stopping in Birmingham in the middle and then we split this into the three different sources. So at the top we've got uh, the exhaust, in the middle we've got passenger movement and the bottom we've got mixed ambient. It's very complex to understand and measure in these types of environments. I explained the ambient environment and the complexity of the different sources. Well, we're moving through the ambient environment on a very long thing with a emission source at the front or perhaps behind you, depending on where you are on the train, with the doors opening and closing all the time. So the atmosphere is changing very dynamically. So bear in mind we've got different um, axes on the left-hand side, um, so they're scaled to account with the different sources. But you can see very clearly when you look at the, the top graph, highest exhaust emissions are when you're in the stations, in a covered station. The other thing to take from that um, top graph is that it's higher on the return journey than it is on the way out. So that tells us, which we knew, which is we were, uh, we were behind the exhaust system on the way back, but in front of it on the way there. When we look at passenger movements, it was clearly more crowded on the way back, so we see big big spikes in emissions from people moving around the train, getting their bags, taking their coats off, etc., whenever it's stopping. Um, and also, we're seeing higher concentrations um, from the ambient on the way back as doors are opening and closing and exchanging air inside and outside. Okay, moving on to my next challenge, which is informing abatement policies. For this sort of work, we, we work very closely with the modeling team. Um, and cooking uh, is, a, is a particular challenge. Cooking wasn't in the National Emissions Inventory. It's only just made it into the London Atmospheric Emissions Inventory. And as you saw from my first, one of my first slides, cooking makes up 7% of PM1 that we measure in London. And this is a challenge for modelling because it's not in the Emissions Inventory. So how do you develop a policy to tackle cooking if you don't know where it's coming from? But it is very important to people the video on the left-hand side, I get lots of these from the public. They are um, concerned about cooking emissions very close to their house. It drifts into their garden, it drifts into their house. So they send me these fascinating videos and hopefully you can see the smoke drifting from one of the restaurants. So working with the modeling team, normally you would do your model, you would, you would um, allocate your uh, emissions to your grid, you would put it through the modeling and you would get a concentration and compare it to a measurement. 
But what we have here is a measurement and very little information on the modeling or the emissions. So we've had to, rather than work in this way, we're having to work this way. Um, and so working with the modeling team, we developed inverse modeling and allocated um, the location and the strength of the cooking emissions according to the location of the commercial cooking um, in, the, in London. And we end up with pretty much the first um, cooking emission, commercial cooking emission inventory um, for the UK and possibly for the world. Um, but it's very focused on central London where most of the commercial cooking is. And that can inform a policy development and we can be able to track then the importance of that policy on exposure. Moving on to ex um, assessing progress, um, we've been, as Gary alluded to earlier, we've been passing data to epidemiologists to do studies and linking them to health effects for many years. Uh, what I wanted to concentrate on here was more of that episodic nature of PM that I talked about. So working with um, uh, colleagues in MPL and the Met Office, um, we've developed a PM dashboard. I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, which allows me to share my excitement about being able to measure all the different components of PM with stakeholders and the public. So this can go to anybody. Um, and we're going to be launching this on Clean Air Day next week. So DEFRA can have it, EA can have it, the public can have it. And what this enables you to do is to um, look at the latest measurements we get from the measurement sites. So this was done um, on the 2nd of June. And um, I'll run you through this quickly. Uh, this wasn't a very interesting time, um, but what we can do is we can see how annual averages um, vary. But if we want to look at a specific location, we can go back to a location which we know was interesting. So I can jump back to the start of 2020, uh, 2022, when I could see in March 2022, there was a really interesting period of high pollution episode, up to 85 micrograms. And we can trace this and show that Different components are from different, uh, um, sorry, the PM is coming from different components and adding it up to our 85 micrograms. Not only that, to show where it's coming from, we take these inputs from the Met Office, so we can put in the date that we're interested in, and it pulls up the back trajectories that show you that it was associated with this back trajectory coming from Central Europe, uh, coming from Europe. Um, the last couple of slides I'm going to show you talk about um, how we establish the health impact. Um, and we're focusing much more on transport microenvironments where we're seeing these high concentrations. And we are taking the Moore system and we are uh, taking people with it um, and looking at their physiological response, taking bloods, uh, urine, nasal lavage, and taking that back to the laboratory. Secondly, we're co-locating people with our super sites where we can understand what the relative contributions of the non-exhaust is and then start to understand how those different sources are affecting their physiological response. Finally, I'm excited about some new measurements coming up. Um, we're developing a portable, emissions, uh, portable metals monitor with some colleagues in uh, UC Davis in the US. And we've recently installed some high time resolution um, toxicological analysis within the super sites to allow us more explicitly to link those different sources with um, health effects. If you want to learn more about this, just follow the group on Twitter. Great. Thank you. Thanks.